All right, moving along here in Amos chapter 3, we will go over the evidences for Israel's punishment. And we will begin in verse 1, but today's lesson is Amos chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, beginning in verse 1. Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. You only have me among the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for your iniquities. Do two men walk together? unless they have made an appointment? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he has captured something? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there is no bait in it? Does a trap spring up from the earth when it captures nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? Do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment or an agreement? Hmm? There's much power, physically and psychologically, power in numbers. This is Old Testament parable that reflects the untamed heart of humanity all throughout history to today. Do two men walk together on the same page, you see, unless they have made an agreement? The context here in Amos is, do two men walk together unless they have made an agreement, an appointment to sin? That's the theme through the First three chapters we've done thus far in Amos. An agreement to sin. So basically, God through Amos and his prophecy is pointing out, well, a conspiracy. God's chosen people conspiring against him, his law, his way. And it's more than two, it's an entire nation. But this parable of two, well... They culturally understood the language, these word pictures. And there has been an agreement to walk in disobedience, an agreement to sin. And they worshiped and honored God in disobedience to the Torah, God's law, in a, in a cut, watered-down manner. They were half-hearted and watered down relative to the the priesthood, relative to the lack of good thorough teaching by the priest and holding the people accountable to what the laws of Moses actually said. And there was this philosophy of culture that crept in. It just crept in and that's still ongoing as observable in the societies of today. Jesus and the truth of sin are all very philosophical. Salvation. Well, there's, there's no authority today, absolute authority of thus saith the Lord, right from the Scriptures. There's not enough men, and, and yes, women, there's not enough men and women taking a stand and speaking boldly and speaking, thus saith the Lord, and living, thus saith the Lord, and holding one another accountable, and society accountable. It's a bunch of soft-tongued, for-profit Sunday school teachers and a bunch of pickpocket pimps behind wooden pulpits. So the authentic context of the historical Word of God, it's become presuppositions of modern world views and religious interpretations of philosophy. Do two men walk together unless they have made an agreement? See, in Amos' day, there was an agreement to disobey and transgress God's law. The same spirit is amongst humanity today. This power of agreement. Agreeing over righteous things 
Well, it's very powerful. Agreeing over righteous things. Very powerful. Just like agreeing together to disobey and sin is equally powerful. Because we're feeding off each other. We are supporting each other in that type of agreement. And you know, it's awful true by nature, uncontrolled human nature, that if somebody says, well, I'll go to so-and-so if you go with me. Because that person wants the support. And so you feel more powerful and confident and able to go through what you're going through if you have support. Two men walk together, right? So if another person is going to support you in, uh, well, adultery, dr drunkenness, gossip, whatever, if they're going to support you in those things, you're going to feel better about that. Walking together by an agreement. And verse 4 is an evidence to sin by admission. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he has captured something? See, lions are quiet. They're quiet animals. Unless they have captured prey. They're on the hunt. Lions don't growl while they're hunting. They'll spook their prey. But once they capture their prey then that lion, well, they'll growl. They'll roar. They take that prey into the den, gnashing of the teeth and growling and victory. You see? So Amos is saying that the, they are the ones that committed the act. The sin, Israel. They've committed it. And they're advertising it. They're making it public. He's saying like a lion roars. Amos is saying to Israel, the lion growls and roars when his prey is caught. So, they're roaring and they're advertising. They're making public their sin, their idolatry, their blasphemes. And they're like a lion that's caught something. Drawing obvious attention. Roaring and boasting. And Israel's making it its sin public. That's what he's talking about the growling here. Causing a scene like the hungry lion victorious over its prey. So we can draw this conclusion from the extortion from the poor, for instance. We went over this some lessons back in chapter 2 of the book of Amos, verses 6 and 8. They sell the righteous for money, the needy for a pair of sandals, remember? They'd make loans and then harass them for not being paid back in a timely fashion. And add interest on top of that. And instead of returning that pledge by sundown, the pledge was the cloak, they didn't return it at sundown as Exodus demands. In fact... They kept the clothing, clothing, and they used it to lay down on as they stretched out beside the altars. And we discussed this at length in parts 1 and 2 of Israel. So they publicly roared, growled. They drew arrogant attention to their sins publicly. And when we get to verses 9 and 10 of chapter 3 in a couple weeks, we'll see Israel's public display of False worship. And we'll get to that. So Israel's very public regarding their lawlessness to God. The whole book of Amos, it, it highlights crimes against humanity. So the lion is very public in the woods with what he has caught. The growls, the roars. So now, God's commitment to condemn by trapping. Verse 5. Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there is no bait in it? When there's no bait in it. 
See, Israel's not even as intelligent as a bird to not go into a trap. So logically, a bird, it recognizes a, a, a bird's not tempted to go into a trap if there's no bait in it. So Amos is saying that Israel is so ignorant because of their sins that the birds are smarter than you. The bird instinctively avoids the baitless hunter's trap. And that there's a trap coming for Israel that they will not avoid. Sin made them blind. Sin has numbed them. And the Assyrians are coming. And there will be nowhere to run. Remember several lessons ago in Amos chapter 2 verses... 14, 13, 14 through 16. The flight will perish from the swift. The swift of foot will not escape. Nor will the he who rides a horse save his life. Remember all that? The bravest warriors will flee naked. So as we go through this book of Amos, judgment will accelerate. And this is an incredible illustration here. Does a trap spring up from the earth when it captures nothing at all? God's purpose is to capture Israel through the trap of the Assyrians. And that's coming up. And Israel is publicly roaring, growling at God's law and bringing this upon themselves. Look what the psalmist says. In Psalm 715, he has dug a pit and hollowed it out, and he has fallen into the hole which he made. That's significant. Wow. Now, God's commitment to condemn by announcing it is here in verse 6. If a trumpet is blown in a city... Will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? The blowing of a trumpet. It's an alarm, right? Look today at the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the experience of living in tornado-prone areas. Okay? The siren that warns evacuation or to take cover. Same kind of deal. When a trumpet is blown in the city, for Israel here in Amos, when a trumpet is blown in the city, well, head for the mountains. Head for the manger or a cave. Take cover when you hear that trumpet. So... The trumpet will blow. And people will get on edge. They'll get up tight. If a calamity occurs in a city to the point of, hey, we better sound the alarm. Blow the trumpet. Has not the Lord done it? So judgment is definitely coming upon them. Not right now, back in Amos' time. Let's get that straight. This is no prophecy for today. Blowing of the trumpet is from God. and We will see the posture that Israel takes in the coming verses and upcoming lessons. This lackadaisical nature. It should have, it should have had an effect on their hearts. An effect on their lives. But they're not listening to the prophet. No more than the world today is listening to our trumpet. The Word of God. Let me read a passage here out of Deuteronomy 32, verse 39 real quick. See now that I, I am He, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. See, to be an enemy towards God, a believer, a regenerate person, 
just don't desire to be disobedient. Believers embrace the information of God's Word as a way of life. It resonates to our hearts. It bears witness to our spirits, right? Verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secret counsel to His servants, the prophets. So when God, all the things by His hand He has done, judgment upon the earth or a people group or something along those lines, God always sends His word ahead of those things. He always announces it. In this case, he announced it to the prophet Amos. And this is, this is biblically true. And I find this, this verse right here just fascinating. Just real quick. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has become before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. And Noah preached, and he built that flotation device to survive the coming wrath, known as the ark. Noah preached and built for a hundred years. That's an example right here. And then there's many, many examples. I'll give one more in Daniel chapter 9, verses 23 to 27. Another example of God announcing three prophets. Daniel was in Babylon. God gives, gives him revelation about the 70 weeks and what's coming for Judah, the southern kingdom, for the next 400 years when they return back to the land. And Daniel speaks about Christ's coming in the ninth chapter of Daniel and how Christ will be crucified and how the people will be restored. Well, let's just read Daniel chapter 9 verses 23 through 27 real quick. And he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. And I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there will be seventy weeks and sixty-two weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. And this goes on from chapter 9 here all the way to chapter 12. So next week we'll get in, move, keep moving along in the third chapter of Amos, and we'll start out in verse 8 of the third chapter of Amos next week. Till next time.